Hey YouTube, welcome to this week's edition of the Super Cinephile Movie Club. All right, everybody, let's get into some current events. Uh, don't excuse my voice a little bit. I went to a college football game today and uh, I cheered really loud, so. Uh, but my team won, so it was really good. So Christopher Nolan is, is, uh, has released a little bit more information about uh, some of what he expects to have in Dark Knight Rising. Basically what he's let us know is that he intends to have two new female uh, characters, principal characters in there. One is going to be the new lead, obviously since Rachel Dawes is dead and they need to get a new one in there. But also, I, I guess they're planning on having a female villain in there, which should be pretty interesting. So I guess you can start speculating on, you know, who, who the villain might be. I'm not too familiar with very many Batman female villains. I do know that there's Harley Quinn, Catwoman, but I also know that he's all not trying to do some conventional ones that have been done before. Catwoman would be out with something like that. But, um, you know, I, I'm not entirely familiar with the whole entire Batman canon of uh, villains and, and heroes and characters and all that, so I guess we can see uh, maybe what, what comes of it. I guess some of the people who, who he's considering casting is uh, Anne Hathaway, uh, Kira Knightley, uh, Blake Lively, Natalie Portman, Naomi Watts, or Rachel Weiss. So, you know, there, there's a whole entire group of very attractive, very entertaining and talented actresses, so um, just from that list right there, you know, it will be, it'll be good at least. I, I have no doubts there that, that uh, whoever he chooses, if, if it's on this list, might not be on this list, uh, he'll do a great job because let's face it, he's Christopher Nolan and he's awesome. Okay, so in other news, uh, Toy Story 3 is, is going to push for a very viable uh, possibility to try to get Best Picture. Not just be nominated, but actually try to actually win it, which is really difficult, but you know, people have, have said uh, different types of films were difficult to win best motion picture in all kinds of categories. But before Sons of the Lambs, people were saying horrors couldn't win a best picture, but then that one. And uh, before Lord of the Rings, uh, Return of the King, people were saying that fantasy films couldn't win a best picture. So who's to say that animation can't win a best picture? I guess we'll see. I know very few critics out there who, who dislike Toy Story 3, so you know it's a very likable film, there's very little to critique about it, but at the same time you run into a, a definite barrier when you have members of the Academy who are very deeply rooted in mostly live action stuff. I only know, I don't know too many people in the Academy that, that are based in animation. I know John Lasseter's one. I'm not too sure of how many others there might be out there. And so you really have to convince them that uh, even though this doesn't include all the trades that everyone else puts into it, such as, you know, costume design, props, and, uh, you know, lighting, gaffing, all that stuff, it has all those things, but it's all CG, and it definitely takes some different kinds of technicians in order to operate that, that kind of uh, effect, as opposed to if somebody was doing it in real life. And so there's a lot of, I, I guess, maybe some people who feel like it doesn't deserve as much credit because they have more respect for the live action trade. But certainly, I mean, Pixar, if anybody has proved that, that whatever you can do in, in live action, you can execute it very well with the right kind of people in charge in CG. So I, I don't know what the likelihood of it would be. I'm pretty sure it's definitely going to get nominated just like Up did last year, but it's difficult to say whether or not that it could actually win Best Picture, even though it is a very likable, very, uh, interesting film. Lastly, uh, Steven Spielberg's been working for quite some time with Kathleen Kennedy on getting a biopic uh, picture going for Abraham Lincoln. Originally, I guess people were looking at Liam Neeson as doing the part of Abraham Lincoln, which I think is, is fine. I think he's a, he's a great actor, but at the same time he's also a personality actor. He's not He's not a very good character actor. He usually plays Liam Neeson in everything that he does, whether he's Qui-Gon Jinn or he's Schindler or you know, the man from uh, from Taken, he usually plays a pretty low-key, kind of soft-spoken individual. I guess what they have now confirmed and what they've, what they've made final is that actually Daniel Day-Lewis is going to be playing the part of Abraham Lincoln. Now he's British, and some people might think, oh, well, you know, what, what that, how, how can a British person play an American president? But at the same time, this is Daniel Day-Lewis. I mean, he's definitely a, a character actor, not a personality actor like Neeson is. 
and uh, he, he certainly played very uh, convincing and very uh, memorable American characters in the past, such as the Butcher in Gangs of New York, and um, and I forget his name, it's been a while since I've seen There Will Be Blood, but certainly he won an Oscar for his role he played there as an American oil tycoon. So anyway, I think that, that that's actually a really good choice, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing how it all turns out with Daniel Day-Lewis as the lead as Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so this week in games, I, I couldn't really come up with any new stuff, so I wanted to just go back to one of our, to our very first game that we played, and that game is linking people uh, through stars that they start with. Like I said before, it was something uh, along the lines of the six degrees or seven degrees of Kevin Bacon that, that you've probably seen in Seinfeld. Oh, hang on a second. I really need to uh, actually kind of follow up with, with previous weeks. I always forget to do that, so I apologize. So, a couple weeks ago I asked you to basically tell me what all the Star Wars films were that have been released in the years that they were released. Because, I mean, I'm pretty sure most cinephiles know what uh, the films are, the Star Wars films are, you should really know, otherwise, I mean, you're not a true cinephile, really. But the years are a little bit harder to follow because lots of us weren't actually even born when these started. Just to follow up and give you uh, the answers to that, the first film is a Star Wars, and it actually was just Star Wars. They added a new hope to it later on, I think, when they made the revisions in like 1999. And that was released in 1977. Then, uh, three years later, in 1980, they released Star Wars uh, The Empire Strikes Back. And then three years later from that, they released Star Wars The Return of the Jedi. Those were the three years for the originals, but then they obviously they came in and did the prequels. And that was The Phantom Menace, which was in 1999, three years later. They keep doing these things in three-year increments. So three years later was uh, Attack of the Clones, and uh, that was in 2002. And then lastly, in 2005, we have Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. Also, last week I had you uh, take a look at some actors out there, and I gave you their real names, and I thought it might be kind of fun if you went and looked it up. If you haven't done that already, I guess I can just spoil it right now, but I encourage you to do it because it's a lot more fun when you find that on your own. Anyway, so Mark Sinclair Vincent is actually Vin Diesel. I thought that was interesting. I mean, he takes he kind of did a play off his last name, it was his first name, and then I guess he threw a type of motor in there as his last name. I'm not sure how that all worked out, but you know, it's certainly a memorable name, and uh, people know who he is, and you know, whenever I drop the name Vin Diesel, it's not like, oh, which Vin Diesel? It's there only one Vin Diesel, so I guess that, that works for him. Karen Elaine Johnson is Whoopi Goldberg. I'm not sure like why she chose that name. Whoopi doesn't really seem to have any motivation behind it. I'm sure she's a creative person who just came up with her own name. Finally, Maurice Joseph Micklewhite is Michael Caine. So that's the fault for the last couple of weeks uh, worth of games. Like I said before, I want to return to uh, one of our original games, which was the Six Degrees or Seven Degrees act actor connection. But again, the rules are you can't look at IMDb on this one and uh, you just have to go off your, your knowledge of, of films and who stars in them and uh, try to connect this week Kathy Bates with Paul Rubens. Okay, so good luck. So this week's film was Moon, directed by Duncan Jones, starring uh, Sam Rockwell. I thought it was a, a, a really great film. Uh, it had a great story, very original, something I guess that, that's more relevant for today, judging by the, the kind of science and, and things that we're aware of, but the kind of a, a plausible possibility we see in the future. What I really liked about it, though, was that it, you know, it, um, it certainly played out for a twist. It, it, well, first of all, it didn't wait to the end of the movie to, to uh, give away the twist. And once it did, you know, sort of introduce the twist, which is that essentially the people we're seeing here are all clones, on the moon, it didn't do it in a way that's sort of like dun dun dun, you know, a sort of a twist of uh, the, the story plot as you thought you would have known it. I, I really like that because I mean that seems overly, I, I don't want to say this but I guess I do, overly Shyamalan to, to wait to the very end and then sort of like spring it on some people and like, look how I just made you go this one way and then I just totally blew your mind. Instead it was it was more or less a part of the story where it was a, certainly a, a mind-blowing revelation but it was very subtle and it, it was integrated into the story very well. The, you know, was the motivation for the plot, it really was the inciting incident, and they didn't wait too long to, to, to let you know that, that what, what was going on and how the characters were going to re remedy it. One of the technical things that I really enjoyed about it was I thought that there was a really good use of, of the focus on the lens. Sometimes there were some really, really tight focuses, 
and uh, to the point where, where only the center of the frame was really in focus and the rest of it was kind of even blurred and that 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 was was kind of artistic and interesting and I, I, I saw it one time in particular where the whole entire thing was blurred and that was at a time when I, I guess the first Sam that we're introduced to the, the clone who's just about ready to finish his three-year stint he he's starting to come to a realization of really what what his fate is going to be that he's a clone and that he wasn't meant to you know go beyond the history or stint and it sort of sort of, sort of like a blur which kind of represented his confusion and his you know just just the uh, overall tensity of the moment because it was sort of a suspense film to some extent he did use what uh, he used a tool that Hitchcock utilized a lot which was a MacGuffin early in the film we're, we're introduced to the fact that the first clone of Sam that we're introduced to he sees things happening he sees things going on and he's not really sure what what's happening he just starts to make him seem like he's crazy you know, and, and at first we think he's the only Sam there is, and so he's just started going a little bit nuts because he's been on the moon for three years. He sees a person who causes him to crash, and uh, for all we know, that could be a hallucination, that could be a uh, another Sam that's out there wandering around somewhere that somehow found a way to stay beyond his three-year stint. It could be a number of different things, and that's not really answered because really it's not pertinent to the story. It certainly worked as an inciting incident for the crash, but overall, Duncan Jones seemed like he wanted to focus on the story of these two clones working together to be able to figure out how to preserve themselves. Lastly, I think I just really like uh, kind of the considerations, I guess, that, that this film kind of puts forward. I mean, we certainly haven't reached a point in our history where we have been able to uh, clone human beings, mass produce them like they have in this film, but certainly cloning around the time of the first clone, when, when they first cloned the sheep Dolly, and back about, that was over 10 years ago, um, there was these, these certain ethical questions of, of how cloning would work and what's ethical and what isn't ethical. And it shows, I guess, since we, we end up realizing that, that we're seeing the, the situation through the lives of two clones, it kind of humanizes it a little bit. It's not like something that we can uh, mass produce or create through uh, manufacturing. These are actual biological organisms. These are people with personalities and they have feelings and they have fears and uh, you know they they want to go home and eventually the one does but the other one has to settle with the fact that he's he's lived three years on the moon expecting to go to earth and ends up having to die alone in a in a rover and so I guess the I thought that was probably the most powerful aspect of it was it was showing you the life uh, or the the existence in a much better way. I mean, we've certainly had films out there that have tried to show kind of the, the worldview through a clone's perspective, such as in uh, Michael Bay's The Island. I don't know, I, I just thought that, that it, it gave a really good consideration. It really humanized it. We could see the definite, we could definitely see the emotions running through these uh, people as they kind of came into contact with things that confused them and, and realization of what the horrible truth was. In the end, uh, this film was was very powerful. I thought it was really well made. I thought Sam Rockwell did a great job carrying it and obviously being able to make a believable conversation between himself in many instances throughout the film. And I thought it was a great original story and it was one that, uh, that certainly made you think. All right, for this week's film, I couldn't really come up with anything that was really fitting for the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. I mean, I, I know that there's certain Thanksgiving-centered films, but to be honest, they're not really my forte. I just kind of wanted to, to focus on maybe seeing a great film that I haven't seen before, but it was just good overall. So this week's film is actually going to be Chariots of Fire. Most people have heard about it, but I'm not sure how many people have actually seen it. Uh, I haven't seen it. I've, I've actually got it as it's one of those films that I bought that I haven't seen yet, so I'm looking forward to watching it. It was a 1982 Best Film Oscar winner. I guess this film is, is a pretty monumental overall just because it, it seemed to address or discuss or just confront issues of, of religion and uh, issues of, uh, I guess, ethics and priorities. From what I understand from the descriptions that I've read without, you know, finding out too much about it. To spoil it for me, is that uh, it's about one very devout Christian man. There's also a uh, Jewish uh, man who seems more focused on recognition and and uh, proving something. I don't know if this is going to end up being a buddy flick or if this is going to be just you know some kind of cathartic 
film where, where they discuss issues of discrimination. But anyway, uh, so like I said before, the, the film is Chariots of Fire, and uh, I look forward to uh, discussing it with you next week.